We shall be having the third presentation on legendary architect Anantha Raze. Indian architectural fraternity needs no introduction to Anantha Raze. He was a revered architect, teacher, intellectual and a perfectionist. It will not be exaggerated to call him Louis Khan of India. Anantha Raze was invited by Louis Khan personally to work in his office in Philadelphia. Raje worked there from 1964 to 1969 in close association with the master. Thereafter, he established his own practice, Anantha Raje Architects in Ahmedabad. But his association with Lee Khan continued till his death in March 1974. During this period, Anantha Raje oversaw the ongoing construction of Louis Khan's Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. So today we have daughter of architect Anant Raze, architect Shubhra Raze with us. Shubhra Raze is an architect and educator who is the founder principal of Shubhra Raze Built Environments, an interdisciplinary design and research practice based in Denver, USA and Ahmedabad, India. She completed her undergraduate studies in architecture at the CPT Center for Environmental Planning and Technology in Ahmedabad and earned a master's in architecture from Cornell University, USA with a double major in architecture and theory plus criticism. Shubhra is a visiting professor of architecture at CPT and the Denver and Boulder campuses of University of Colorado. In addition, she has taught at her graduate alma mater, Cornell University. She has lectured extensively and been a visiting critic at the universities in the United States, continental Europe, India, and China. So may we have a big round of applause for architect Shubhra Raze. Thank you so much. Um, Ravi Khushru, uh, AESA. Um, it actually really is a privilege. Um, every time I'm actually called to speak on uh, my father's work, um, since, um, like Rohit and Vandani, um, I'm, I'm, I'm his daughter, we were great friends, but um, uh, my father actually actively discouraged um, uh, sort of Guru Giri in a sense, um, uh, uh, being able to sort of explore the work for its own rather than through reputation was something he inculcated in myself and my sister from very early on. So I would hope that, um, uh, and that's why it's, it's, it's a privilege, these opportunities, because each lecture is revisiting the work. Um, so I hope um, all of you look at this less as an exposition or a presentation of his work um, uh, by an expert um, and more of an exploration. Um, so with that, um, uh, beginnings as um, anybody who's putting together a presentation or working on a project or embarking on anything, um, beginnings are sort of both scary things but also very exciting things and um, they preoccupied Raji as well. Um, beginnings in terms of uh, the developmental origins of a work something that engages the vital and intangible relationships of context and the fundamentals of circumstance surrounding each particular work. So the first questions, these preoccupied him, and encounters, meetings. Um, so as Ravi mentioned, um, all throughout his practice, Raja also taught, um, and um, in a 99-2000 second year studio, so talking to about 18 and 19 year olds, Raja began that particular semester, um, and I know this because of uh, uh, the, the, the sort of incredible recording work that his teaching assistant at the time, architect Paat Shah, who is now practicing in Rajko, did. So we have access to this material that otherwise sort of gets lost. So in the semester, he sort of began speaking of the site in this way. He said to his students that every time you encounter a tree, you encounter a shadow. 
The largeness of the shadow generates a sense of shelter. Therefore, when we talk about shelter, we associate it with a shadow. And so shadow and shelter are synonymous. And I thought that was rather interesting because we always associate Raje by way of Khan with light. Um, but to, to, to link shadow to something so inhabitable rather than an aesthetic sort of um, uh, association was something quite significant to me. The sketch is actually done from 1967. Uh, it was a period of, he was ending his time at Philadelphia, so it was his later years at Philadelphia. He was traveling a lot. And um, just the period before he came to India. So the sketches I'm going to show in this lecture are going to be mainly from sketchbooks of that period to give us a sense of what he might have been seeing, recording, observing, perhaps thinking. Um, so there you go. So shadow and shelter are synonymous. So, and shadow brings with it the smallest blocks of context, as I talked about, the sun, the breeze, and the ground. Together, they generate it and give it character and also a position. A building is rooted in the soil in which it sits. Actually, Korea used to say that quite often, representing that part of the truth that belongs to architecture. And the idea of shelter thus begins with the substance of context before the design of organizational space or space for the sake of form. So this was a project done in 1991 for a close family friend in Ahmedabad. And it is a structure where during weddings, the family of the bride receives the groom and his entourage, you know, the Bharat. So what Rajay did was he located it under the shadow of an existing mango tree, thereby making the tree starts making the roof and the canopy. And there you see some of his um, initial thoughts about what, uh, how he was thinking about dealing with this. To accommodate itself with the aesthetic vocabulary of platonic solids of the Shodan house, so um, these were, uh, this was in the Shodan compound, designed, of course, as we know, by Corbusier, to the cube, Rajay brings a cylinder. And so in, in terms of the site plan, you have, you have the driveway, of course, and fortunately, this big, lovely mango tree was at the bend in the driveway, and that's where Rajay situates this. The house is, of course, um, uh, right there with, with the domestic staff. Um, the swimming pool is here for those who are familiar with, with the Shodan house. Um, and the, the final actual wedding, uh, the, 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 the fire and the ceremony uh, was going to be there. So that's really the situation of things um, under the mango tree. Um, it's a cylinder which is in two parts, actually, and asymmetrical. And it was made with sun-dried bricks on an existing concrete pad and driveway. And um, specifically sun-dried bricks because um, traditionally in, in many communities, they don't want any metal present um, in anything to do with weddings. Um, the stability provided by the shape as well as the wall sectional profile, which has a sense of almost the foundations that are uh, generally buried, they have emerged from the ground, this sort of stepped structure. In other words, it was a form that was inf informed both by its structure and its making in addition to its association to the larger context of Corbusier's architecture and platonic solids, etc. And this is a theme that you will see um, again and again in Rajay's work. It is finished um, by very simple mud plaster and accentuated by these ablas, these little mirror uh, works that you find in North, all over North Gujarat on clothes, uh, in houses, etc. So he brought this sort of a thing. Um, and the bride's family, which actually um, I was part of uh, the whole thing, um, participated in this phase of plastering and finishing. And as you can imagine, you know, when you're doing this, uh, it's, it's you're anticipating the wedding, everyone's happy, there are songs and stories and laughter. And the bride also being a sociologist, anthropologist, um, it was a wonderful sort of confluence of making with the occasion of, 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 of the wedding. Um, and of course, on the wedding day, everything is resplendent. There are all these diyas and flowers and whatnot. Um, 
The walls, of course, came down following the wedding because uh, it was only meant for the wedding. The driveway was washed away, and life in the household returned to the everyday rhythms and routines. Um, now, I began with this project um, because although in its materiality it is an exception, Rajan normally didn't use sunbright bricks, um, nor is it sort of a beginning of his work chronologically, um, I believe there are clues for us to understand Rajay's architecture and the locus of his practice and his search. Uh, clues into Rajay's attitude to context, precedence, and continuity. Um, it is not very often that you get to build um, next to um, uh, uh, who we consider masters, and uh, I find it interesting that these are conversations that he's having. Um, if the wedding wall was this ephemeral moment, um, meant to sort of be there and then disappear, an expression of a poetic enclosure, in the Ravi Mathai Center, this is in the IIM, um, and we'll go into that a little later, we also see this focus of human gathering expressed through a sense of boundedness. There, there is a certain sense of boundary, a definition. It is designed to accommodate in the spirit of agreement in order to consolidate a whole. So what do I mean by that? If uh, most of you, if you're familiar, have seen the, 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 the IIM plan, this is the main academic complex that Khan designed, the library, the faculty offices, and the classrooms, with the dormitories to the right beyond. And this was um, Rajay's task of designing this particular center that had an auditorium, certain offices, and this plaza. So we'll go into that a little later. Um, let's see. Yeah, so in terms of the IIM campus itself, Everything that's in white was essentially designed um, um, when Khan was alive. Um, uh, if I'm correct, probably from 1960s to 74. Um, and everything that's in gray was um, in some form or the other um, uh, continued. Um, uh, in, uh, there, was an, there was an independent office uh, which was Doshi Raje. Doshi continued as a liaison because he was that uh, in the original construction, but um, he was the silent partner, and it was Rajay who designed these. And the three most prominent buildings, apart from the residences, were the kitchen dining, that was done first, um, the MDC, which we'll, we'll see a little later, and this Ravi Mathai Center. So this is the situation. Um, so what you see in terms of the Ravi Mathai Center are Two plazas, a sort of twin plaza that Rajay talked a lot about. I'm going to speak a little less on that. But a formal Khan plaza and uh, perhaps maybe not so formal Ravi Mathai plaza. Um, the program was simple. Like I said, uh, the, the institute at that point lacked a formal auditorium space. Um, 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 and then there were some support offices to the academic functions that went on. Um, now, much has been made um, since we, we are, this is in the context of the IIM. I thought I would sort of locate these two architects working um, uh, one after the other. Um, much has been made in the scholarships of Khan especially of his achievements in restoring the power of the axis. Um, so here you have, of course, the Sork Institute with the Axis and the Pacific uh, in the horizon. And of course, the Khan Plaza, also a very monumental actual um, space. Now, Michael Lewis, he delivered, uh, he's a historian architect. He uh, delivered a very interesting lecture in 2017 on the occasion of the Khan re retrospective, which was called Lewis Khan, The Power of Architecture. And it was actually at that time in 2017 housed within the Kimbell. It was just a wonderful uh, sort of coming together of um, a retrospective within one of his most iconic works. Um, however, so Lewis proposed an alternative reading to this whole business of the axis. What he considered, or at least proposed for us to think on further, uh, the most significant accomplishment of Khan was uh, in bringing life back to modernism that had become formulaic um, was this, 
that when we look at modern architecture, um, we see that it had con uh, conceived a new space, and we know this uh, when, when we study history. This, for instance, is the Crown Hall, Mies van der Rohe at the IIT. Um, and what you see here is a kind of, you know, a heroic roof truss, a kind of an exoskeleton that holds the roof up um, so that the interior has no partitions whatsoever. We don't have rooms, we don't have walls because of uh, that marvelous sort of structural um, engineering and expression. All we have is space, the sort of flowing space. This is what modern architecture um, uh, 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 conceived, created, imagined. Uh, Mies abolished two elements of architecture that had been there, present throughout architecture's history prior to modern architecture, the enclosed room and the solid wall. And Kahn brings them back. This is what Mike, Michael Lewis is saying, and I think we would agree. This is, of course, the inner central atrium at the Exeter Library. He brought back the room as the fundamental unit of architectural expression, not flowing space without shape or boundaries, but a fixed and definite poetic enclosure. And with Raje, what you see is that this room meets the tropics, the hot and dry tropics of the regions that Raje lived and practiced in. It is a simple exchange of priorities and emphasis in that it prioritizes the enclosure of context over the enclosure merely of space. So it is not just a courtyard. So therefore it is in Raji's architecture, this, this, this sort of a room, a sort of bounded space without a roof that is open to change and the cycles of the sun and the moon to growth and to decay. This was to become the anchor for Raji and it's making an architecture that evidences its immersion in time where the walls that unclose architecture are the same walls which close this outdoor room. So it's this duality that he's constantly working with. So in the development of Ravi Mathai and its various iterations, you keep seeing the preoccupation is that in order to link his building of the Mathai Center with the Khan, um, the Khan buildings of the academic complex, what he's looking at is not a stylistic continuation, but what he's looking at is how does the space continue and yet create their own distinctive sense of rooms. So that was the first sort of uh, iteration. You see several other iterations but that garden, that sense of uh, the outdoor room persists all the way through into, of course, what the final sort of solution was. And through that, through that preoccupation of finding a sense to that room, um, that the plan emerges. And the final plan, of course, you have the faculty offices and the faculty courts, more importantly. And across that, you have the Mathai Plaza, which are enclosed by then the programmatic functions. Um, you have the edges and then you have the main house. So therefore, in the Mathai Plaza, if you see, in, in the Ravi Mathai Center, there are two kinds of relationships that um, Raje begins to initiate. One, of course, as I said, through the faculty courtyards, he is trying to link the Mathai court, the Mathai plaza, to the Khan plaza. And the second is a relationship between an outdoor room and an indoor room. So there are two of these going on. Raja was occasionally questioned, especially regarding the Mathai plaza, and especially if we go back, you have the parking here, the auditorium is here, but the entry foyer is actually you sort of go around the building, arrive at the plaza, and then go inside the auditorium. And Raja was often occasionally questioned more by students, of course, um, but sometimes maybe by fellow professionals, um, why this, this was so. Because normally, wouldn't it make sense that you come, park your car, and then go into the, you have this wonderful lobby, whatever, and you go into the, um, uh, uh, the auditorium. The significance of the Mathai Plaza for Raja um, 
had to do with the fact that it was an important space after the program. He often said that when you're, when, when, before the program, you're most likely rushing to the program anyway because most of us are always late or anticipating the program. It's a different energy. You're looking forward to something. But it is after a performance that you're full or you're content or you're full of questions. And that is where you appreciate a place to linger, to discuss, and, and really, truly, sort of, in a way, reflect on what you have just been through, and therefore that sequence. In the section, therefore, what you see is a certain equivalency, a certain equal weightage given to the outdoor room and the indoor room, which then, of course, becomes the auditorium. Materially, concrete seems to be associated with the making of space, the indoor space, whereas brick seems to be associated with making the enclosures, less to the auditorium, more to define that plaza. So the brick, brick enclosure is oriented. This is the lobby of the Mathai Plaza. The auditorium is to your right. The plaza is to the left. And what you see is that the lobby is actually oriented to the plaza, not really to the auditorium by this curved wall. Um, and, and also oriented back, this is the upper floor of the lobbies, um, oriented back to the context beyond that, which is the faculty courts, and therefore a larger context. This, of course, is the concrete, um, uh, the, the indoor room, um, uh, which employs concrete. We'll come back to uh, this later. Again, a more formal enclosure. So you have the formal outdoor enclosure of the Khan Plaza, the formal indoor enclosure of the auditorium, and the, Ravi, the Mathai Plaza is sort of an intermediary, um, making relationships to both of these. In the making of the plan, both the freedom and discipline are expressed through the organization of space and material. Um, this is the final version of it. Uh, the Mathai Plaza is here, the parking is here, and the Louis Kahn um, uh, Plaza is there. This is a study model uh, for the development of uh, the concrete folded plate roof, and I do remember uh, uh, Mahendra Raj uh, being consulted upon. Um, uh, since, as we have seen, he was obviously very experienced in um, folded plates. And there was a reason that, um, that, that Rajin needed um, 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 uh, consultants, especially um, um, in, in the study of this particular structure, because the, the, the sort of the roof of the auditorium, the indoor room, uh, was of course designed to span but it was also designed to divert water so it wasn't planar, and more importantly, to perform acoustically within the space below. Because I think um, uh, in extension to um, what Rohit talked about and also what Sachin talked about, um, that period of, of architecture and building and engineering seemed to be one where not only was it necessary, but it was in a way sort of a way of life where there was an economy of means that was always tried to sort of, um, that you were trying to achieve so that you do much more with less. Um, this slide is the meeting of the concrete volume and the surrounding brick enclosure, and that space between becomes um, the sort of aisles leading the audience to the main chamber. So you're sort of taken through the structure within the forces and under, much like you know the aisles below flying buttresses in cathedrals, etc. So here you are again, a very robust interior of the auditorium, where the meaning of use and the means of making are overlaid. The concrete undertakes, as we saw in the model slide, many responsibilities, um, and the walls are faceted as well. Again, for acoustic purposes, um, it's a sculpting that is possible given that concrete is a poured material. 
Um, so these are the facets of the wall. Um, uh, and therefore, what you see is, uh, and these were designed both in consultation with the structural engineer, of course, because um, uh, uh, the thing had to stand, um, and the acoustical engineer. The main sort of impetus for this was so that you minimize the application of acoustic materials later on. Um, it was, I think, later on somewhere, uh, once he had told me, why cover up a less durable material uh, a, a more durable material with a less, uh, lesser one. So here what we are seeing is trying to sort of push the limits of the material, not just structurally uh, or formally, but in terms of many uses. Um, so we see, in general, that for Rajay, plan is intention. And the intention is to give form, in a sense, that is to articulate the relationships of activity, use, making, geography. So it's all these relationships that bind us. That is the intention of the plan, to articulate those relationships. So jumping back, this is a small little house for another friend outside of Ahmedabad um, in a little place called Sadra. Um, people were building a lot of these farmhouses. I think they do continue building. Anyway, this was one such. It's a very different scale and situation. And here the outdoor room is created by pulling apart two constituents or components of a house, essentially. One of assembly and gathering, and the other of solitude and retreat. And bringing a sense of enclosure to the room via a plinth that you see in the model here as well, and a bounding wall, along with the components as well as trees now used architecturally. Um, and the two structures, as you see in the sketch, become silhouettes which provide the outdoor room its definition. Um, in a certain way, you see the two components of the Sadra house, the living and the sleeping unit, further sort of articulated in the Nandan Mehta house. Now, this was within the city. Um, it was an existing uh, plot where the main family sort of Haveli sat here. These were musicians. Um, uh, uh, who have, those of you who are familiar with Ahmedabad and its musical uh, scenario, these were the family that set up the Saptak Foundation. Um, so there were a lot of gatherings, as, as is natural in the music world. Anyway, so this was very different from the Sadra house, but the, the search and the investigation remains the same. So the living now splits into a chamber of light, and its associated space. Similarly, another chamber of light and its associated space. And the rest of the house really is just a thickening of a wall. Yes. And what that does, especially in this particular case with uh, the specific delineation and plan, is that a corner is able to reorient itself back to the main space of the compound such that um, there is a very natural progression um, uh, from, from where you enter the site all the way into the destination which becomes this courtyard. So it is an arrival court, this one. The outdoor room here becomes a place of arrival, of introduction, where you gather into and also where you disperse from. So yeah, this was a sketch done in 1969. As I said, I've included certain sketches just for us to pause and, and relate back um, because ideas migrate. They're not chronological, as I'm sure you'd all agree. Things that you have sort of built up traveling and, and working and accumulating through your life tend to reappear in various ways later on. Um, and this, of course, is also MDC. And here, the chamber of light um, actually becomes an outdoor room. The location of the MDC we have already seen. Uh, it's, uh, it was the second sort of major uh, addition that uh, happened at the IIM. And it was for um, executives who were already in the field. It was a post-professional program. They would come, 
reside here and then um, attend uh, continuing education classes, hold seminars, etc. Um, it is located basically at the end of the faculty residences, so you can imagine it's a scale which is ground plus one. So although in terms of its plan, it has a certain resemblance to the academic complex in terms of two wings which are more sort of modular and uh, a center which has uh, the more uh, sort of uh, the larger volumes and symbolically where learning happens, accumulation of knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, its scales are vastly different because what Rajay did was that in order to control the scale so that it's a little more sympathetic to the residences that are its immediate neighbors, he sort of uh, pushed everything down. So it is a bit of a sunken court. Um, uh, this is a loggia to the court. Um, now, although Rajay's plans, so this is uh, from somewhere here. If you look back into the court, this is what you see. So that is the relationship. Um, now, although Rajay's plans appear to be geometric drawings, when you really begin to examine them closely, you realize that they're not really about shape uh, making, but they're compositions in terms of space. Space is what light makes with it. Um, um, light as the architectural generator. This was Khan's language, which also sort of seeped into um, uh, Rajay's work. The first architectural element, therefore, is the element that through light gives you pools and pockets of shadow, and with it brings a sense of shelter. And finding an economy in the expression and delineation of these elements was the discipline. So light was like gold dust, he would tell his students, especially in um, uh, the younger years. He would say, a little goes a long way, and too much is just vulgar. So the areas of use can be manipulated um, to the demands of, of the plan uh, um, uh, and of various constraints, but the elements of light are at the very heart of the project and because they are related to the sun and the air. Now, these light elements are actually generative elements, by which you mean that everything else in the plan is organized around it, and they can be deciphered as an understood in the plan through their distinct positioning. So at the MDC, for instance, that this loggia now is that space. And so what you saw here is this surface of what are essentially four light wells that take the light from the roof all the way down to the basement since the whole project is sunken down to maintain that scale. Um, so you have these large expressions here and then all along the courtyard you have a real thickening of this edge inhabited by circulation, by movement, by sort of veranda loggia spaces this has a certain generosity because it's, it, it, it sort of represents the scale of gathering, whereas they become individual veranda spaces when you're dealing with individual residential rooms. So there's a definite logic through which this all comes through. Um, this is, of course, the sunken court that you see with the, 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 the edge here and the loggia is behind. These are the individual rooms, um, certain sections that you see through the court, cross sections. This is through the staircases of the loggia. This is the loggia itself with the light wells. And this section is taken across the light well, where you see the steps of the court coming all the way down so that from the dining hall, etc., you can go all the way seamlessly into the court. It also gave great climatic advantage, of course, by burying everything down below. Um, to the large spaces, which otherwise always are sort of difficult to control climatically, and of course we are talking about without air conditioning. Um, and, and so there you have now that light element. Um, now these wells diffuse the sun and make the concrete luminous. So the light wells are made out of concrete much like in the Ravi Mathai Plaza, where, where you needed space, you called upon concrete because it's generous, it can do things. 
um, and also enable the hot air to rise up and out back. So they were both climatic devices as well as, of course, um, uh, bringing light and, and structuring the plan. Um, and it is also a junction, therefore, where the horizontal meets the vertical. And these meetings are always occasions. They become points in plan that you have to sort of be mindful of, is what Rajay said. It's an occasion of light, he used to say, which you can in inhabit. This is across now all those four light wells. The scale of the light elements with its pools of shadow begins to suggest activity. And this is, um, uh, again, from his um, um, sketchbooks. He's sort of, um, they are undated, um, uh, but it was sort of within his 1967-68 sketchbooks and also unmarked in terms of its location. So we don't know if these were just his thoughts or it was actually in a place. However, generally speaking, Rajay's sketches are not scenic recreations of a view. They don't just describe, they analyze and explore opportunities. Um, and you begin to see these explorations um, bringing together activities, elements of architecture and plan making. In the previous slides, you sort of saw circulation in, in some sense, certain areas which may become verandas in the future or loggias. You also begin to see how the light element and staircase, which is a ver vertical circulation, may have opportunities. Some of these are related to projects. Some of them are um, sort of ruminations by themselves. And so once you have, as we say, um, uh, the, the sort of outdoor room deciphered, uh, the architecture begins in making that room and its enclosure and the edge. And it's not really the building per se. And therefore, you're sort of saying that it's the making of the edge. Um, these are some of the sketches, again, uh, that are looking at uh, how at various times and various locations you have the sense of the edge. Um, even when he sort of draws uh, buildings, he a lot of his sketchbooks actually have only portions of buildings that are sort of looking and investigating certain moments within a plan or within, within a building. Um, uh, also this thing. Maybe now that uh, these elements begin to come together in order to make an edge, therefore then you can manipulate that edge. So repetition of a singular moment sets up a sequence, he would say a sequence which integrates an occasion with light and the material between. The making of a sequence assures an edge, and that makes an order. When you can discern an order, the plan becomes legible with regards to its intentions, and that is what the architecture is the result of. So for him, these moments were not for pattern making or some sort of stylistic signature. And this, of course, is uh, him working similarly on this is uh, the Islamabad project in Khan's office. Um, you don't have very many pictures, but it was kind of interesting for me to see this um, picture. So from the singular courts of the MDC and the Mathai Center, what we have here is um, a really a small hamlet of a project. It's, it's an incredibly compact project. Um, and it is a farmer, a dairy farmer's training institute located in North Gujarat in the district of Banaskata. At that time, the NDDB was building a lot. They were building dairies, which are uh, to the east, uh, which is the top of the slide. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Kurian was, was uh, um, the head of the N uh, NDDB. Um, uh, Kanvinde was building a lot. And um, as Rohit has, had mentioned, Kanvinde was also a very generous architect. He would actually invite uh, the commissions he got. He would actually recommend, perhaps you should give it to this architect and that architect. And not many architects these days do that. So. Um, um, anyway, so here we have, this was a, 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 a dairy training institute. Um, you sort of, the, sen the arrival um, from the dairy complexes into a sort of an arrival court from which, from which you sort of, you encounter a blank wall and you come into a second court, which is probably 
further sense of arrival, but you're beginning to sense that you're getting into the interior, that leads you to a, a sort of a, a, a sloped court that opens out onto the fields, and another a sense of a court that leads you through a threshold to the sanctum court, flanked by classrooms, and this courtyard is, is sort of enclosed by certain rooms on one side, and dining, some kitchen area, and its courts as well. So it's really a sort of quilt, a, a careful quilting of uh, these sort of open rooms, the outdoor rooms, with just enough enclosure to give them a sense of space. The bounding walls make both the indoor and outdoor rooms, especially something like this block is so interesting because you actually really don't know what is the priority here. Is it these rooms and the classrooms are just thickenings of the walls or is it the classrooms which need to have two courts? And it's that ambiguity that makes this just such a sophisticated plan. Um, and here, Rajay seems to be testing distinctions, like I said. The relationships between outside and the inside are not established by the erasure of lines. Um, what these days you hear all over the place, this blurring of the inside and the outside. He doesn't do that. For him, it is a question of drawing the right lines. And architecture begins when these lines begin to relate rather than separate. So for instance, the ceremony of arrival, the place of introduction as I said, from there, like I said, the whole ceremony all the way back into the sanctum, which is actually a place where you began from, except that the two don't meet. They, sorry, the two don't meet. They only hint at each other. So when you're at the arrival, you're amongst the rugged walls, but you always sense that there is some sort of paradise beyond. Um, So these overlays, therefore, um, also if we see in the plan, you have the overlays um, of the place of introduction comes first, then comes a sense of arrival, and finally, finally a door if it absolutely has to. These are the overlays that begin to suggest a place and allows the architecture to elevate the function of an entrance, for instance, into a whole ceremony. And that is what became Rajay's architecture, and it also became um, something that gave richness and depth that we experience, actually, whether we can articulate it thus. Of course, this is um, the physical solution, um, um, study models. It was interesting when I was looking at Sachin's presentation and the thermocol model, since I had apprenticed at Korea's office, and. Um, uh, up to that time, um, the architectural sort of landscape was the Ahmedabad landscape, and the Ahmedabad architects were, worked on, they always had a carpenter at hand, and they worked in these gorgeous wood models. And I remember going to Korea's office, and the first day seeing a thermocol model and going, what is this about? But of course, there was a logic of speed of thought associated with that. Anyway, so uh, this was... Um, uh, as I said, uh, I, I find the small little project tremendously sophisticated. The outdoor room, of which there are several different types and scales and also positionings, um, through their spatial organization and order of geometry are held into a harmonious whole, reconstituting the context and also reframing the terms of enclosure. This is the setting. Um, uh, it is nothing like this now, of course, there are dairies all over, and yet this little thing holds. Um, I'd gone there, I think, two years ago or something, and it's doing just fine. It's just a new setting. Um, the character given really by rough cut stone, which is what was available there, and fairly rough concrete, actually. It wasn't really very um, uh, crafted or very uh, sleek concrete, uh, Ando style or things that you see today. Now, in order to develop an edge and make an opening, one needs to develop an element of span. Um, in, uh, in Rajay's architecture, except um, in the brick enclosures of the IIMA project, because he was making a sort of um, 
a, a, lingu a linguistic link in a sense um, um, within that campus and also because it was a, it was a campus, uh, Rajay thought that it was necessary to continue certain attitudes to materials. Um, in IIM, you see Rajay employ brick arches, but in his work, in his independent practice, you never see that. It's always concrete that is employed in uh, the spanning of elements. And to Rajay, this element of span was not merely a lintel, but it was a logical development in terms of loads, shear forces, and bending moments. The exercise is very critical um, and significant um, when you see his work, because in order to find that it is possible to express stresses and hubs of their distribution. The form of the lintel then is the result of sculpting away extra material, taking away material where you don't need it. And it's not a stylistic motif to be employed in pattern making, or worse, like I said, a signature to establish a brand. Being sculpted thus, it is naturally able to express shadow bringing three-dimensionality to even the most basic of surfaces. And therefore, now you see that court of, of Galbabhai um, and the bounding walls that give it form and the establishing character of the project. And you begin to see the various explorations of that lintel. Um, and this is uh, the dining uh, veranda, really. It was because um, everybody ate on the floor. Um, and here what you see is that uh, that edge now starts to become quite anthropomorphic because it is sort of stretching out in all directions to receive the roof on the one hand, the element of span on the other hand, and eventually begin to sort of get this thickness that then can be used for um, a more human scale of seating, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you begin to see from one single preoccupation an entire sort of development of an architecture and the language and an attitude. And Rajay continued with this, unlike most architects, throughout his life. Um, he did not sort of jump on trends. Postmodernism didn't mean anything to him because his search was very, very focused just on the articulation and rearticulation of this outdoor room. It's really quite fascinating in the context of um, everything else that was happening. Um, uh, yeah, so this is that uh, 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 the innermost garden that actually makes its presence felt uh, from the outside. And this wonderful threshold element that you really you sort of encounter this and you begin to wonder, what is it? Is it a space in its own right? It doesn't even matter that there are classrooms on either sides. It invites you, gives you a glimpse of that wonderful courtyard behind, and yet it holds its own. And it is able to hold its own because it is, again, doing various things. It is holding the structure that supports and makes classrooms possible. It is a locus both of forces as well as human gathering. And this is what lends the significance to Rajay's work. Um, so yeah, so it makes a meeting of the people coming out of the classrooms, structural forces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the junction, therefore, the meeting, the coming together, through its multiple overlays, establishes a sense of place and again, a very dignified locus without any sort of acrobatics or anything of that sort. It also has a scale that corresponds to what is going on. And at the western boundary, along the residential rooms, that lintel that we talked about now begins to assert itself as an element in its own right. Um, a distinct entity, not within a wall, but by itself adjacent to a wall, um, which in our climate is really a shadow pocket within which somewhere is an opening to the room. Much like the ceremony of arrival, what Rajay is suggesting here is there is a ceremony to making a window. And, and those of you who I think studied under him, that was maybe one of his mantras that, you know, a window is not a hole in a wall, and it is a place of light or chamber of light, etc. The articulation maintains its root, though, in the structural behavior in terms of bearing and stiffness and ties 
if it starts getting too torn. And the design language is one where the simple frame is turned on, on the face into a membrane and a concrete membrane, which is not very thick. It's about 150 mm, through which then openings can be cut out. So what you have is, like I said, it was a search again and again of the few elements that Rajay kept calling and recalling into his architecture. So what you see here is further development of that design vocabulary, extending the lessons of Galbabhai into projects that followed, such as the IIFM and Bhopal, which was also in a similar climate. Now, uh, these sort of sketches, as we saw also in um, uh, Rohit's presentation, is um, uh, they are really uh, uh, now post facto reflecting back to these works. These are really significant, way more important than photographs of buildings, and I can't assert this enough, because presentations are gregarious and are performed for effect. Exploration, on the other hand, is private and is experienced for discoveries. And an act of presentation almost always denies that exploration. The same attitude we observe in Rajay's work in its attitude to making, actually. And that's why um, I think when um, Ravi had asked me, you know, try and mention something about Rajay so that we can all get closer to him. All I can say is he was a very private person. You look at this and decipher for yourself what sort of a man he was. He would be very uncomfortable if I started going into um, many other things about how he lived. Um, so structural expressionism, not for its own right, for the sake of demonstra demonstrating expertise. This was not what he was about. It is part of exploring how the meaning of use and the means of making can overlap to create a richness and depth of the architectural experience. And actually, that's why his closest friends were structural engineers, whether it was Mahendra Raj or whether it was Sharad Shah, who was a consistent presence all the way through his projects. Um, these were the people we knew, um, uh, even as, 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 his, as his daughters, uh, with more f uh, familial sort of relationships than his architectural colleagues. Um, not as a rule, but um, they were very significant presences, and I remember that very well. Um, this sketch, for instance, um, a progression, a certain sort of refinement and finalizing of certain attitudes is defined both by what is being studied and also by the relationships between its being a hand drawing and the act of exploration. Thinking does not happen for the sketch to be made, Rajay would often say. The sketch is thinking in process. So what we begin to see here is Rajay bringing together aesthetics, design language, and structure and the structure is fully integrated with the element of light that, that those first generators. And so all of this is a continuum going back and forth throughout his life. These sketches show further refinement, for instance, of um, the pavilions at the IIFM. These are more firmed up drawings now, um, uh, 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 studies of the various conditions, corners, um, sections. Um, uh, yeah, he drew obsessively. Uh, I didn't work in his office, but I do remember. And of course, when we were sort of dealing with his collection, uh, <laughs> there was just an incredible amount of drawings. Every um, sort of moment in a project had, had 50 drawings of all sorts. And then, of course, the physical solution. The photograph shows the transition from the masonry mass going all the way up through the, tie, the tying lintels into concrete by itself um, and its aprons. This is a view of the apron corner. Um, the corner here relieved um, by keeping it open, therefore further emphasizing the sort of lightness and the freedom that the concrete in the apron had from bearing loads that the masonry below is subjected to. The lower parts are related to load, as well as the movement and circulation of people and with water. Rajay translates this lower part um, 
as, as he looks at it as a plinth, as part of the plinth at the water's edge, and the materials used at the bottom express that restrictedness. The restrictedness is important, again, to affirm the periphery and the edge of the enclosure so that the sense of enclosure is maintained. And yet, by placing the pavilions at the edge of the water, through the reflection, you relieve this weight, you know, in terms of your perception. And these are the ambiguities, the lightness of the concrete, the heaviness of the plinth, that again, the whole thing is relieved by a certain lightness, aesthetically. Um, these are the ambiguities that Rajay seems to relish whenever he gets the opportunity in a project, for they make up the reality of things. So having studied that, those were the two that we studied. Um, uh, we came by way of those into the project. This is the academic complex. Uh, so we began at the water's edge, and then we go in. Once again, every time there's an element, it signifies a threshold, a meeting, a, a relationship between indoor rooms and outdoor rooms. So, so that sort of attitude to plan making uh, continues. Really quickly, in terms of uh, how things are laid out, you have faculty offices here with some administrative functions, um, seminar rooms here, which are distinct from classrooms, um, an auditorium, and a library. Each one having its own courtyard to sort of gather into and disperse from. And that really is the plan. Um, um, and these are working plans uh, where um, you see this incredible richness in terms of uh, the white is essentially your, your room, your, the way we traditionally understand room, which is um, uh, bounded walls, a roof, and a floor. All the others are various degrees of, 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 um, and layers of, uh, of the semi-open and the open. But if you sort of inverse your thinking, that is where the plan began. And it was these that were called upon to give these an articulation and a definition. So um, these were actually photographs I took uh, uh, last year or something. Um, these are the faculty uh, courtyards. And on this side is a connection between the library and the entrance along the faculty offices on the other side. Um, these are sort of these outdoor rooms that precede the seminar rooms behind. And this is the library seen from the connecting bridge between the seminar room and the classrooms. And again, what you see are, 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 are layers. Um, and this, of course, is the site plan, um, the, the uh, Institute of Forest Management, that is what the IIFM is, was located on a hill. Um, the entire campus is this hill. But what Rajay um, did was to consolidate and concentrate the building to very, very few locations. Um, and so there, there's a concentration of this built such that the majority of the site is left virgin. This is not lawns, it is native, uh, native sort of um, vegetation. Um, the water strip collects water from the complex, and this is designed to percolate through these channels downhill into sort of the, 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 the sort of, um, yeah, downhill. The majority of the site is left to itself to regenerate undisturbed. And this approach was a part of the institute so the clients focus as well on their area of research. It is linked to um, an Australian uh, method called the Bradley method, among others, and over time has been uh, quite successful, actually. Um, so what happens that in time, the horizon beyond that water strip to which the academic complex opened out to has slowly disappeared, and, the and it's in turn now bounded by the vegetation and the architecture sort of enters into a whole new condition. And this was almost factored in. So this is um, maybe a year or two after the uh, 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 institute opened, and this is probably last year or the year before. And so what you have here is another, a fairly profound dimension to Rajay's architecture. And that is the architecture is seen as a means to trace the passing of time. 
and the structures and surfaces find life through time leaving its trace. Um, with that, we come finally to uh, another small little project which was never built, but it was concurrent to what was going on uh, with his Bhopal exercises. Um, and this, is the, uh, this was a proposal for the Bhopal Gas Tragedy Memorial. Um, and it was located on another hill because Bhopal, I think like Pune, has many hills, overlooking on this side to the Bada Talab. So Bhopal has two lakes and this overlooked the, uh, the, big, uh, the Bada Talab. Um, it is a memorial in Bhopal where the scheme is located to an epic landscape now, where scale is less related to size than age, being concerned with the scale of time. Um, in terms of the general description, I, I, I think people entered here and sort of just walked through the landscape of the hill, um, arrived into a series of sort of arrivals and meanderings. I mean, it's a memorial, so it doesn't have function. It has sort of these experiences that architecture and landscape together can create. A water pool and then a pavilion, an open pavilion that is oriented both to the lake, and apparently there's a Shiva temple in the lake, but also the skew to orient towards Mecca, a sort of bringing together two religious sensibilities because both had sort of been affected by the tragedy. Um, so it is, um, and the water again, like the IIFM collected, is allowed to flow down the hill. And because this was more rocky than the IIFM site, what was anticipated to grow, and he worked with the folks at IIFM, um, was more moss rather than vegetation, which changed colors seasonally. This is the floor plan that you see. This is that water body, rocky site, etc., etc. Pavilion. Rajay, in a 1969 entry in his sketchbook, he writes, in building there must be something unfathomable. Call it a point of reference to fa fathom other things. In these things too, if one is if one thing is unfathomable, other things take their respective positions around this point of reference, and so on to infinity, he says. In Raji's work, this unfathomable is not symbolic or abstract. If you really look carefully, it is actually rooted in the material and its making. The biography of construction and forces are right there. And yet, it is through making that a liberation from material is found. His architecture explains and yet provokes wonder. And it is that place between the unfathomable and the fathomable. Thank you. Thank you.